Hello. Uh, it's great to be here with you all. Um, we have really heard a lot so far in this conference about these new mediums for design, right? All of this incredible technology that's emerging. But actually, it's still pretty early days in a lot of these areas. And getting broad participation in working with these new mediums of design is not a, an obvious, uh, there's no obvious answer for how to do that. So we're gonna focus uh, between now and lunch on this topic of emerging mediums in design. And you're gonna hear from two people who really exemplify what it looks like to deeply understand the technology and also bring together a real sense of human values and uh, really just some amazing thinking about what the world might look like when you apply these new mediums for design. And then we're actually gonna have a demo of an activity that we hope you will very actively participate in. Um, some curriculum that we've been developing at the D School at Stanford to really try to bring more people from wide ranges of backgrounds, different disciplinary perspectives, into this movement around designing with these new technologies. So let's talk about mediums. This is one medium. Every designer in this room is probably extremely familiar in working with this medium. This is one of the first things I learned how to work with when I came to the D School. It's physical, it allows you to really express ideas early on and explore a wide range of ideas. But these days, students that we teach are working across a widening array of different kinds of mediums. And they're really expected to be versatile across this array. So we might have a class at the D School where students are designing a product or a service. It could be digital or physical. They have to be thinking about the experiences that they're designing, the moments, the emotions that go along with that. We want them to be thinking about what's the system behind that product or service, or in some cases to be designing in a system or around a system level challenge like uh, the criminal justice system or the educational system. Increasingly, students have to be well-versed in what technologies are available that might allow them to actually bring their solution into reality. And we've talked about this so far uh, yesterday and today. Data itself is becoming a medium for design. What kind of data are you sourcing? How are you actually designing with it so that you can avoid biased outcomes? And where we want every student who takes classes at the D School to really uh, emerge is with the capability to consider the implications of their design work, to imagine prospectively what is the, the positive future that we uh, are designing for, but also what are some potential unintended consequences, negative and positive. And we want to cultivate that ability to be able to think really critically about what those implications might be. So this is non-trivial, this is a really wide array. And these new mediums that we're gonna focus on today are challenging as well because they right now require a high degree of expertise and investment to be able to design with them. Um, they're increasingly intangible, which creates all kinds of challenges. And um, they can get to scale very quickly. So if something unexpected happens, you have less and less time to really course correct. So, What's exciting to see is that we're just at the beginning of tools and standardization kind of uh, parts that uh, are making these mediums increasingly accessible. So for example, everyone in this room I'm sure is familiar with the classic uh, story, the origin story behind the founding of HP. The founders were working together in a garage in Palo Alto um, in the late 30s. But today, in your own garage, if you so choose, you can order parts off the internet, including a DNA sequence, and you could do something like grow a culture in yogurt that will produce very similar effects to Prozac. So if you would like to join the DIY biohacker movement, you can do that for about $1,000. And to learn how to do this, of course, the obvious solution is you can go to YouTube, right? Just like you would if you're trying to learn how to fix a car or bake a cake. We're also seeing new communities come to spring into being around these intersections. So this is a community in the Bay Area of about 1,400 designers and architects and artists and data scientists who are really starting to come together to explore and to teach each other and to develop a common vocabulary so that people from all of those disparate disciplines can start to work together and realize the potential of, in this case, the new medium of machine learning. So 
we see the emergence of these tools and these ways in which we can imagine very soon in the near future, many more people will be participating. But the reality is that because of the, the high degree of expertise that you need to design in these mediums well, it is still a fairly small, fairly non-diverse community of people who are really engaged with these, with these mediums. And what happens in that case is that the values and the ideas and the, and, and the ability to think about what the prospective implications might be are gonna be limited to just the community of people who are actively designing with those materials. And that's something that we are really working on at the D School in terms of how we're developing curriculum to start to break down those barriers and actively include a much broader array of, of people working to design. So um, we're gonna try a little experiment here. Um, I'm curious about the range of levels of experience in this room with machine learning. So we probably have quite a range. We probably have some true world-class experts in this room who uh, can code an algorithm in your sleep. And we probably have people here who are just really starting to learn about what machine learning can do. So uh, if we can have the lights up a little bit. Uh, if you are one of those experts, if you are just like, cranking out algorithms every day, all day, please go ahead and raise your hand. I know we've got a few. Don't be humble. Go ahead. Okay. Well, very, very humble. Okay. If you're more in the middle of this spectrum, if you're like a four, five, six, and maybe you work closely with people who design in machine learning, but you're not the coder yourself, go ahead, raise your hand. Okay. So that's a fair number. Very nice. All right. Now, if you are more like the majority of the population of the world, and you are still kind of trying to figure out what do these words mean, what do they mean to me, go, raise your, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, so I hope you are paying attention. This information is gonna become very relevant in a few minutes when we ask you to get hands on in thinking about how you might design with some algorithms. All right, so we're taking this curriculum to places like high schools. So this is an example of one of our colleagues, Carissa Carter, teaching 400 students at a local high school, um, a expanded version of what you're gonna do today. And we're seeing some great results. So what's very exciting is the way in which when you start to deeply understand what this technology can do, your imagination about those future possibilities is not constrained. And we wanted to start out with two people who really exemplify what that looks like. So in a few minutes, we're gonna hear from Dr. Laura Kleiman, who is the senior flavor scientist at Impossible Foods. And she loves to make people happy with food. Um, and she's gonna make an exciting announcement at the end of her talk. Uh, before we hear from Laura, we are going to hear from a woman who designs in a virtual space. And she creates moments, she creates opportunities for people to have an aha that triggers empathy, and that prepares them to take action at a moment when it might matter the most. So to kick us off, please join me in welcoming the CEO and founder of Vantage Point, Morgan Mercer. Hashtag Me Too. This is a social movement that you guys might have heard about, but what this actually represents is more than just a social movement around workplace harassment. This represents that we have a global problem with negative interpersonal relationships. And by the way, this isn't the first social movement of its kind. We've actually seen half a dozen others globally. Japan, France, Germany, Finland, for example, have all seen movements of their own. Aside from just being a social movement, this actually has real calculable, quantifiable costs, both financial and emotional. 80% of women who report sexual harassment leave their company within two years. And just for a data point, the United States alone has paid out over $699 million in the last 10 years through the EEOC. So what do movements around sexual harassment, such as Me Too and workplace training, have in common? These movements have been happening over the last decade, but workplace training, as we know it, has been around for 40 years. So I'm sure that you all have had the opportunity to you know, sit in a lecture, and I'm sure that everybody's had the opportunity to zone out during the lecture. I'm sure that many of you have had movies or you know, a video or an email up on your, TV, your computer screen, and instead of paying full attention, what you're doing is you're texting your coworker about what you're gonna eat for lunch. You're thinking about an email your colleague sent you the other day. 
What if I told you that virtual reality training could increase retention by up to 75%? Why is that? Let's start with an example. Imagine you're preparing to give a speech. You can practice for hours. You can have it nailed completely down to a T. Your friends have heard it, your colleagues have heard it, your family's heard it, it's perfect. You go up on stage to give your speech. You walk up, you stand confidently, and you blink. Why is that? It's because your nervous system has overridden any of the information that you've memorized and retained. And this is true of any high stakes, high pressure, or high emotion situation. But now imagine that you could put on a VR headset and practice giving that speech in front of an audience of 5,000, how perfectly you would perform. This is called state-dependent learning. And what that means is that you will learn the best when you A, live out a scenario, or B, win a scenario simu simulated. My medium is virtual reality. And this is what it looks like when I develop. I can't explain what it feels like to feel cold. I can't explain what it feels like to feel hot. I can't explain what it feels like to feel happy, sad, uncomfortable, the elephant in the room. But when you can simulate that feeling and tie that feeling to an action that people can have or take to influence the environment around them, that's when training becomes impactful. We leverage branching narrative storylines, so think of it as a pick and choose your, your own story or adventure. And what we actually do is we incorporate real-time feedback, scoring systems, et cetera. We give users agency and show them how they can positively influence the environment around them. Speak up sooner, the situation gets better. Speak up later, the situation still gets better, but not as good as it would have been. What we actually try to do is design situations that feel like real life. So everything isn't black and white. Something that looks fine on day one isn't fine on day three. We design with this medium, and what we actually design for is to design around experiences that translate in real life, but don't translate on paper, because that is a possibility of the medium. Here's a look inside the world I work in. So when we design with virtual reality and immersive mediums, we have to think about a few things, such as what are the possibilities? What are the limitations and constraints? What is our end objective? What's the outcome we want? And really what I like to call, why are you even using this medium to begin with? Some of the things we think about is how can we leverage user agency? How can we leverage game theory? How can we leverage gamification and positive and negative reinforcement? And more importantly, how can we leverage these things and create worlds that feel real? How can we give users agency over their environment without breaking that third wall? without breaking the feeling of immersion. And this is really important for us. We're always tiptoeing that line, straddling the balance, because we're not an entertainment company. How do we make experiences that feel real while designing within the limitations of the medium and leveraging the medium for what it's really meant for? Imagine looking down and seeing this. It would feel weird, right? If that's not what your hands look like, it would feel like you've been assigned an identity. And what we actually learned is that assigning somebody an identity, whether it's a gender, an age, or persona, can actually influence the choices they make inside of the experience. And because VR is so real, what happens in the experience can influence the belief systems people hold outside of the experience. Our critical design decision was a conscious omission of detail in order to avoid unconsciously influencing the outcome. We show you the most relevant details and we allow humans to fill in the blanks. So what's next? What I encourage everybody to think of VR as is a platform. A lot of times people think of VR as a technology. Things like voice recognition, NLP, AI, machine learning, sentiment analysis, et cetera, these are technologies. But VR is a platform just like your phone or your computer. And what I believe is that because VR is a platform, you can actually measure things such as, where am I looking? How am I responding? Am I scared? Am I angry? How is my face contracting? How am I breathing right now? And I believe that in the future, we will see a world where you have user-curated training, where the material you see depends on the exact responses you're having real time. But what we should watch out for don't design based on assumption. Unfortunately, 
a lot of executives are men. A lot of game designers, a lot of technology leaders, a lot of program designers are men. And in the future, we do want to see that change. But right now, what I encourage everybody to think about is be conscious in areas where you could unconsciously have bias and how that could be built into a program that you design. I think we commonly see this a lot in video game design and with the ways that women are portrayed. So the last thing I'll leave you with is, especially with immersive mediums where they are so real, so visceral, so impactful, and so influential in shaping our external beliefs, good design is conscious design. Thank you. So uh, as Sarah said, my name is Laura Kleiman, and I am a senior flavor scientist at Impossible Foods. Uh, for those of you who don't know what we do at Impossible Foods, we make all plant-based alternatives to animal food products. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about some of the problems that we're trying to solve there. Uh, so basically, um, in order to keep up with the demand for, uh, for meat as the world population continues to increase, we have had to industrialize meat production. Uh, and the result of this industrialization has led to some pretty devastating environmental impacts. Animal farming is responsible for using 30% of all of our fresh water, emitting 15% of all of the global greenhouse gas emissions, and covering almost half of uh, the Earth's land area. And the reason that we see all of these negative impacts is because animal farming is extremely resource intensive. Animals are basically a food production technology where we feed plants to animals and they produce food that we can consume. But the problem is that they do this really poorly and the conversion efficiency is actually super low. Uh, beef actually has the lowest conversion efficiency of all of the uh, animals that we use for, for food production and only 3% of all of the protein and calories that are put into the system actually turn into calories and proteins that humans can consume. That means that we're throwing away 97% of all of those resources. So I think it's pretty clear that using animals to produce meat is a super antiquated and inefficient technology that basically hasn't been updated in almost 10,000 years. So how are we looking to solve that problem at Impossible Foods? Well, we already know that people love meat, right? Because meat is amazing. It tastes really delicious. It gives us the protein and nutrients that we need for our diet. It's also a huge part of our food culture. Um, and we don't really have the time to ask people to change their behavior and to stop eating meat. We already know that that approach doesn't work. And so what we're doing at Impossible Foods is tapping into something that is already ingrained in our, in our lives and in our culture. And because people already love meat so much, we don't need to do anything to change the product. We just have to come up with a more efficient way of making meat. So the way that we do that, our approach at Impossible Foods, is to deconstruct meat to the molecular level and understand what are all of the building blocks that create the entire meat eating experience that people love. And when you break down animal meat into its building blocks, you find that you have things like proteins, nutrients, and fats. And every single one of those building blocks is super important for, again, creating that entire meat eating experience, where you have proteins that will give you the juiciness and texture that people love. Um, nutrients like amino acids and vitamins allow for the generation of delicious flavor upon cooking. Uh, carbohydrates uh, help to keep everything together. And fats give you that sort of like unctuous mouthfeel. And so what we determined at Impossible Foods is that you can actually use those exact same building blocks, but now from plant-based ingredients, to uh, give you a product that has the exact same taste and texture as meat from a cow. And so while it's really crucial to have that, the whole meat eating experience for people to adopt the product, we also understand that flavor is king, really. And so what we've uh, determined is that 83% of people actually rate taste as the number one driver for their decision when they select food, followed by price, helpfulness, uh, and convenience. So we wanted to ask, what makes meat taste like meat? Why is it so delicious? So if you take those precursors that I talked about, the different amino acids and sugars and vitamins, and you cook them in the same way that you would cook meat, 
you get a product that's kind of savory, but it's definitely not meat. And I'm sure people here have experienced a sort of veggie burger like this before. But uh, at Impossible Foods, the really important discovery that we made is that when you cook these precursors in the presence of a magic ingredient, you get that burst of delicious meaty flavor. So what is that magic ingredient? It's a molecule called heme. Uh, heme is an iron-containing molecule that is found in every single living plant and animal, um, and it is responsible for carrying the oxygen in your blood. It also drives all of that delicious meaty flavor upon cooking. And so heme, in the form of myoglobin, is found in very high concentrations in animal muscle tissue. Right? It's what makes steak look so red, and again, what makes it taste so delicious. But we actually found that you can find heme in the form of hemoglobin in the root nodules of soy plants. And if you cut them open, like is shown here, it's actually bright red with heme. It almost looks like a juicy steak if you zoom in. Uh, but we needed to find a much more efficient way to produce heme at scale. And so we turned to synthetic biology to take the genes from the soy plant and recombinantly express them in yeast to produce heme at a much larger scale through fermentation. And this is a very similar process to the way that rennet is used for cheese production or the fermentation of wine and beer. And so while heme and flavor generation, again, are very important for delivering that delicious taste, all of the other components that give you the texture um, and the, the sizzle during cooking are super important as well. So we also turn to plant-based ingredients for that. We use soy protein to give you that texture and chew, as well as all of the nutritional benefits. We use coconut and sunflower oil for that fatty mouthfeel and the sizzle upon cooking, and then potato protein to help bind everything together. And the result, when you, build, when you put all of those building blocks together in the right way, is that you have a product that looks, cooks, and handles just like beef from a cow, but made in a much more efficient and sustainable design process. So the key takeaway to me is that we're not redesigning the final product, right? We already know that meat is a product people love. What we're doing is redesigning the process to make it. And for millennia, right, we have used animals as a, a technology to take plants and turn it into meat, but we are cutting out the middle cow, as I say at Impossible Foods. We are redesigning <laughs> the process to make meat directly from plants, right? We don't need the cow anymore. And the result of doing that is that you have a much more sustainable and efficient process. We're able to use 74% less water, 87% fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and 95% less land as animal, as animal farming. And as I mentioned before, we, we don't have the time to be as precious as we've always been about food. Um, and in my opinion, it would be a really big disadvantage if we didn't use all of the discoveries and learnings from various scientific fields and apply that to food production. Um, but the problem is that humans, they love these sort of artisanal products, especially when you think about food. Uh, and one of the challenges that we face is that the current meat industry is trying to convince consumers that uh, changing or updating the process that we use uh, to produce food is a bad idea. Uh, but I'm really hopeful that consumers will realize that they still have a choice and that they will demand the better choice. Um, and luckily, that is what we have been seeing. Consumers really do get it. The demand for Impossible Burger um, is really high and continuously increasing. We are in about 6,000 restaurants across the US, everything from Michelin star to fast food chains. Uh, we want to be able to be accessible to everyone. Uh, and the very exciting announcement that Sarah mentioned is that literally today, we are now available in Singapore. Yay! <laughs> So we launched in these seven different restaurants. Um, I really think tasting is believing, so I urge you all to go out and try the all new Impossible 2.0 uh, and see for yourselves how amazing of a product it can be. Feel free to check out our website for more information as well. Thank you. So I have been a vegetarian for almost 30 years and I had an Impossible Burger on Friday and I, om I had put it down in the middle and double checked the ingredient list because I felt like I was cheating. Like somehow I was, I was ruining a 30 year track record of being a vegetarian. It was so meat-like and quite tasty. So I do recommend you try it. 
All right, so we are closing in on our activity. And to get us started, I want to, in the briefest of ways, introduce what machine learning is all about. So I have a very important question for you all. Is the picture that you see on the screen hot dogs or legs? All right, so if you think it's hot dogs, please go ahead and raise your hand. OK, most of the room thinks it's hot dogs. Anyone for legs? OK, we're pre it's pretty decisive. Good job. What about this one, hot dogs or legs? Hot dogs? All right, again, we're looking at some clues that are like those grill marks maybe. This one looks a little fake too. Anyone for legs? Okay, oh, the few in the back, all right. <laughs> some, some burned legs, great. Okay, what about this one, hot dogs or legs? If you think these are hot dogs, raise your hand. And what about legs? All right, more decisive on legs. If you're, if you're looking at the context here, you might see that this photo was taken very close to where we are standing right now. So what we're doing right now is we are behaving like an algorithm does, right? We are looking at some visual data and we are classifying whether that data is hot dogs or legs. Let's do one more. Hot dogs or legs, <laughs> right? This one's kind of gross. So this one, like, we, we as humans, we can perceive this is a joke, right? This is someone responding to the hot dogs or legs meme and putting something fairly funny and quite disturbing out in the world. So, however, if you were a computer algorithm, you might be trained to look for the presence of condiments. And so, actually, your first instinct might be, these are hot dogs. So this is a great example of where humans actually can get the context and get the joke and get the nuance, but we have to train our algorithms to be able to do that. So again, in really brief terms, here's what machine learning is, right? It fits into this broader category of artificial intelligence, which is computer processes that really mimic how human intelligence works. And machine learning is a subset of AI in which the performance of the machines improve over time. They improve with experience and with training and sometimes with supervision from, from their, human, their human owners. And then you also may have heard of deep learning, which is where a lot of the really groundbreaking research is happening, in which people are trying to get these algorithms to behave more and more like the way that the human brain makes connection and understands context and understands nuance, uh, things like semantic analysis. These are the AIs that are starting to be able to see and to listen and respond to us. So, at the simplest level, how do you actually get your algorithms to improve over time? And the answer is, you train them, right? You tell them what behavior you'd like to see, and you see the performance, and you give some uh, positive reinforcement when you see the correct performance. That's the, just the basic concept to hold on to. So what can machine learning do? We've heard lots of examples so far. Here are a few more. So machine learning can help us recognize, similar to our hot dog legs debate, on the right-hand side you see the classic important game of blueberry muffin or chihuahua. <laughs> on the left-hand side you see uh, a project that uh, daily grabs one photo from Wikimedia and tries to uh, verbally describe what's going on. It doesn't always get it right, so this is an example where the picture that was being described was described of a as a group of people standing on top of a cutting board with cake. Okay, so not perfect, but it is improving with time. Machine learning can be used to recognize and detect. Um, are there patterns here? There's a lot of incredibly exciting research going on in radiology where people are using machine learning to get better and better at detecting signs of tumors in breast cancer and lung cancer um, and actually far performing, outperforming uh, human radiologists. We're all familiar with these applications, predicting the weather, predicting the value of your house when you're thinking about selling it. It can be used to help navigate. And to optimize is another example. So the picture on the lower left-hand side is a, a map of the United States um, based on proximity to the closest McDonald's. So you could use this information to help you optimize where to put the next McDonald's or where to put a gym or a competitor. So uh, I want you just to be thinking about these basic categories. This is at its, in its it, it sort of simplest sense what machine learning can do and a little bit about how it works. So to lead us in an activity that we have designed to be as inclusive as possible, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Catherine Segovia. All right, hello everyone. 
Uh, Sarah just shared some ways that we can use machine learning. And I'm excited because today I get to introduce you to an activity that we use at the D School to start interdisciplinary teams uh, to play and experiment with design choices using algorithms. So I want you to look at the people at your table. Maybe you pair with one or two other people. Um, don't worry if you answered a four or a one on the scale earlier. I started there too. This experience is designed for all of you. So let me give a little context to a design challenge. Where are we working? Let's use the flu, okay? It's in full swing in many places right now. About five to 15% of people will get the flu this year, and it makes us feel really cruddy. All right, here's a few facts. You might already know some of these, but a couple of reminders. It spreads through little droplets in the air, so when we sneeze or when we cough. It spreads quickly in large groups of people that are in close contact, so airplanes or conferences, dare I say. Uh, hand washing does help, so do that. <laughs> and infants, the elderly, or people with chronic ailments, they are a little bit more likely to get the flu. Um, so, uh, let's imagine a little bit further now. Looking at the people beside you at your table, let's pretend you're co-founders. Uh, you've been working on a concept that is designed to help people who are about to get the flu or who get the flu. And you've worked on one that you're particularly excited about, and it's this. It's a care package for the flu. All right, so when you get this care package to people in one of your towns or your cities, um, if they get it before they're about to get the flu, they can take some vitamins and their immune system recovers a little bit and they don't get it. Or if they get it after they get the flu, they take some of the medicine or they use the tea and that helps them recover more quickly. And the impact has been really positive, so nice work. Uh, so positive, in fact, that you have been asked to scale the solution to 10,000 towns, all right? So from one town to 10,000. Yeah, I just saw some facial expressions. It's like, you might feel a little bit overwhelmed by that. You might have a lot of questions about who are these people that really need to get these care packages? You don't have an endless supply of these care packages, so you need to get them to the people who are kind of most susceptible, who would need it most. Um, and you probably have a lot of questions about the types of people. Uh, here are some questions you might have about the people that you would be designing for in these 10,000 cities. Do they have children that are in a crowded classroom in a school where their children might get the flu and bring it home? Are they visiting schools? Or are they visiting shopping malls, right? They're in touch with like, a big group of people that are in close contact. Maybe do they have a job where they wash their hands frequently? Right? They might have a lot of other questions, too. You're all probably coming up with some questions that you'd want to know about the people in these other towns. Now, let's imagine a little bit further that there's a lot of data out there, which there is, and let's imagine that we could get access to a lot of it. We might not be able to get the access right now, but let's pretend for the sake of today's activity. So for some examples of data that could help us answer these questions, um, what if we could get school attendance records at schools in these towns to help us understand if children are in these crowded classrooms? Um, what if we could get location data from the GPS on your phone or your car that could share where you've been? Maybe crowded places, we'd want to know that. What if we could look at your social media profiles, right? We could definitely do that and see what type of job you have and whether you wash your hands frequently. You might also think of like a lot more provocative data. What if we could get um, the records for psychology appointments or therapy appointments that suggest when people have been treated for anxiety? People who have anxiety have a little bit more susceptible immune system and they might be more likely to get the flu. That could help us deliver these in an effective way. All right, so now you're equipped. You have a little bit about the design challenge space. You know about your concept and some of the questions you might ask or some of the early forms of data we could get um, access to. Now let's play with some algorithms, all right? So each of you at your table has a deck of these cards. You can grab a deck for your small group. Yeah, thanks for jumping in. And inside you'll find six algorithms. There's a few cards for each algorithm. So if you pick one type, go ahead and grab the three cards that go with it and get to know it a little bit as an individual read about the description of, let's say, classification. Then, in a minute or two, I'll ask you to just share with your partners what you're learning about that type of algorithm. You might not understand it perfectly, and that's okay, 
but go ahead and get started. I'll give you three minutes to just get to know the cards and the algorithms in your packets. All right, I love how you are jumping in. Thanks so much, what a great audience. Um, go ahead and as you're starting to learn, share a little bit of what you're learning with the person beside you, right? Tell them, I think this algorithm does this. See if you can fill in the blank and just share a little bit about your learning. All right, if I could go ahead and have your attention. So thanks for jumping in. If you have questions, you're in exactly the right spot. If you think you've learned something, that's great as well. Yeah, I hear some laughter already. Okay, so I'm going to give you the next step of the activity. And here it is. You now have some algorithms. You have some questions about the people that you want to design for, and you have some ideas of what data might exist. We are going to use this fill-in-the-blank sentence to create some examples of design choices we could use with algorithms. So I know I'm from a school, I want to say right away, we're not giving grades, there's not right answers, you're just experimenting and writing something down, okay? So here's the sentence, I wonder if we could use an algorithm type, fill in one of those six types, and a certain type of data to do something that would ultimately help us better understand who's likely to get the flu. All right, I came up with a few examples. So here's one. I wonder if we could use a classification algorithm and maybe pictures of cars at shopping malls last week to determine who might have been at a highly contagious location. All right, that's one we could try. What about this one? I wonder if we could use a dimensionality reduction algorithm and shopping purchases over a last month to learn what purchases might tell us something about flu avoidance or maybe even flu contraction. You could learn with that. So at your table, you have a worksheet. On the left-hand side, you'll see this exact statement. With your partner, I'll give you two minutes right now to go ahead and write down one or two examples of one way we could use these algorithms or data types, okay? Again, no right or wrong answers, just a lot of ideas that we consider. And I might call on you to share later, so please do write it down. All right, hopefully you've chosen an algorithm type by now. Go ahead and write down the algorithm type, and then fill in the last two sentences. You have one, or the last two blanks. You have one more minute to finish this side of the worksheet. All right, so hopefully you have an example written down on the left-hand side. It might not be perfect, and that's just fine. We're going to move on to the right-hand side. And earlier, Margaret from Facebook actually said, what is it like to cultivate some healthy skepticism? And we want to do that right now in this activity. So probably a lot of us have seen an example of machine learning or a design choice that maybe had some questionable outcomes or didn't feel like the correct or the ethical design choice. Let's try that on for size right now and fill out this sentence. I wonder if it would be terrifying if we could use a certain algorithm type, so one of the six types in your card deck, and insert a type of data you think you might be able to get access to, to do something that again will help us identify the people who might be likely to get the flu. So I tried one on for size, you can see my sentence. I think it would be terrifying if we could use a classification algorithm and therapy appointment records to understand who is most anxious uh, because those people are, have a more susceptible immune system, and then use that information to help deliver our care packages uh, to the people most susceptible. I think that feels terrifying because it puts mental health on public display. But you'll come up with other examples as well. So go ahead and take the next two minutes to fill out this side, the right-hand side of your worksheet. All right, so you have one minute left to finish this side of the worksheet, and then we're going to hear a few examples. So if you've come up with something you're excited to share, make sure you've jotted it down so we can hear some of the ideas in the room. All right, everyone, so thanks so much for diving in. I'm really impressed with the interaction, and I've gotten to hear a couple of examples already, but why don't we share as a big room I know we're a really big room, so that might be a little hard, but is anyone out there, um, have you written down something on the left-hand side of your worksheet, let's maybe start with the positive, that you're excited to share about, that came up as an idea of a way you might use algorithms? Ah, oh, 
Oh, thank you, sir. Great start. So I'm, I'm not sure if this is a positive or a negative. We, ah. we kind of figured that it would work for both sides. Okay. Uh, I'm Jeffrey, by the way, from Chemistry, a local design agency. Um, so I wonder if we could use clustering and Tinder data paired with medical records to understand which groups are susceptible to the flu and understand the spread of flu through these specific dating groups. Wow, you got, <laughs> you got right to the heart of it. Okay, actually, why don't we just do a little snapping? So, uh, sorry, your first name? Uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, Jeffrey wasn't sure if that went in positive or terrifying, but let's just take the pulse of the room. So if it's positive to you, just go ahead and snap maybe. Okay, yeah, a little <laughs> snapping out there. Now, if it's terrifying, do you go ahead and snap? Wow, yeah. But also, I wonder, truly predictive, so there's some cool design tensions here, right? I think that's a great way to figure out how this I'm actually more spreads. worried for outing myself as an unethical person, so <laughs> I, I'm not. <laughs> I try not to be. <laughs> okay, thanks for jumping up to share first. Um, other ideas. What are other ways we could use algorithms and data? Maybe a positive one now that we've had at least the room say that was terrifying. Oh, I think somebody's just getting volunteered by their partner over here. <laughs> Would you mind, sir? Okay, we'll get a mic here so we can hear you. Hi, I'm Tristan. I'm a content strategist and a freelance writer. Um, so our hypothesis was it would be terrifying if we could use clustering and the data would be the people who use toilets very quickly and also those who have no access or never ask for a hand sanitizer to find the chances of people who are likely to get the flu. So this could happen in an office space or a school, yeah, anywhere. Thanks, you've actually hit on one of the big learnings here in machine learning, which is it's probably not one algorithm and one type of data that's going to get us to the answer. So you're looking at some purchased items, it sounds like, in hand sanitizer and um, some information about where bathrooms are available or what their work setting looks like. Yeah, I think that could be very predictive. Um, I heard somebody over here choose toilet paper purchases as a way of predicting, or tissue paper, I should say, maybe, but maybe both, honestly, um, to help predict who's most susceptible. Um, okay, let's see here. I think for time we'll move along, but we've heard a, a, a positive and some terrifying examples. We think that that's a true result of the people in the room today, that because we had some diverse perspectives and brainstorming some options, we're seeing a greater diversity of possible implications. And at the D School, we're really passionate about doing that. We're really passionate about bringing people together early on in the design process with a tool that can help varying levels of expertise engage. So thanks for diving in with me. This experience is under development at the D School, we actually have another longer experience that goes with it, but I'd really love to hear your feedback at lunch and what it was like to engage. So thanks a lot. All right, so uh, thank you for diving in. I hope that you had some fruitful conversations and maybe learned a little bit more about machine learning. Um, we find it's pretty interesting actually to be talking about this very intangible digital, uh, primarily digital medium in something physical that seems to actually make things more accessible when people are just starting out. And we really believe that it is vital that we have broad participation in designing with these technologies, right? So in our educational context, it's that we want the students who are coming from a history background or an econ background or a biology background to be participating actively along with the engineers and the data scientists in how this technology actually gets uh, put into play. So, those tools need to be designed, right? The, the way to have that conversation across disciplines and to start to actually really bring people into the fold. And that takes work. That has to be an active practice of, of inclusion. We think that when people start at that basic level with designing around, you know, at the technology level, at the data level, that that will have a different outcome when you are then designing around that implication layer. Right? If you have a much broader perspective on your teams um, of people who are imagining what the future consequences will be like, you're gonna have a richer set of values and a richer set of ethical conversations. So I love the fact that that first example we heard made a lot of us uneasy, right? If we don't actually practice what it's like to 
casually think about how you might use data and an algorithm and how easy it is to create a, a future that we actually don't want to live in, then it's, it's just not gonna be clear how that happens uh, when the folks with, with the expertise are designing with these mediums. So we um, are, again, excited to hear your feedback, as Catherine said. Um, we think that this has utility, again, in, both in education and also in business context, as more and more people are starting to bring um, this type of technical expertise onto teams. And although this doesn't yet look exactly like what design is as we know it, um, we think that it will very soon. So I want to just thank and acknowledge the many people who contributed to the content uh, that we went through today. And thank you all for your participation. <laughs>